Welcome back. This week, we're going to try something new. This is the first time I've done this particular program for week one here in the final project class. But I think it's important that we all have a common understanding about research as an activity. And I thought the best way to demonstrate that would be to do some research about research and share it with you all so that as you start putting together your thesis papers, you'll have some idea how I think about it and what we're looking for in your thesis paper, because this is when you're actually going to do research about how your capstone project turned out. What is the process that you went through to do it and to publish it? And then what have you learned about it after you put it up and promoted it on social media? How much impact did it have? What did it do in terms of likes and shares and retweets and comments? And then what have you learned from that? That if you did another one, what would you do differently? What would you do better? What worked and what didn't work? And how will we back that up so that it's not just your own personal experience, but you have some understanding about how the, the science of your, your publishing worked, how your conclusions are drawn validly. So we'll also be talking in here next week about how to do proper research writing, and I will give that to you in a down and dirty uh, easy to follow format. And then as you start drafting your chapter on drawing your conclusions and recommendations, I'll talk a bit about how to use logic and reasoning to make sure that your conclusions stand up. So I'll kind of be talking you through this section by section. Right now, you're going to be trying to state your problem. What is it that you're trying to research? What's the point that you're trying to make? So I'm going to walk you through some background about how research works, why we do it the way that we do it, and why it's so important that you publish some kind of paper to explain uh, what you are all about. So we're going to uh, dig into research about research itself. So is this a true statement that if you steal from one author, it's plagiarism, but if you steal from many its research. That is a smart remark that has been floating around for years and years. Uh, I even had a friend of mine, uh, she put it up on her Twitter account a couple of weeks ago, which is what provoked me to include this here at the outset, because it sort of offended me that if you steal from many people, it's research, as though it cheapens the act of doing academic research. And I don't think that's the case. I think it's because people don't exactly understand how research works and why we do what we do. So that's what I want to express to you. So I tried to figure out where did this quote actually come from? And there's a website that I'm going to recommend to you called quoteinvestigator.com. And the people that work there try and figure out where did all of these famous sayings, like none who are so blind as those who will not see, where did that come from? Is that from the Bible? Is that from Shakespeare? Where did it come from? And here's what these people found about that particular quote. If you look at your uh, first italicized statement here, if we steal thoughts from the moderns, it will be cried down as plagiarism, if from the ancients, cried up as erudition. Meaning, if you quote Aristotle and Cicero and Plato, you come off as smart. But if you steal from the people of the common day, then you're just a thief. And that came from um, a preacher of those days. Then when they looked in a, a journal in 1932, their own researchers found that a guy at McGraw Hill, a publishing company for which I've actually worked, he said this in a talk to librarians. It is plagiarism if you steal something out of a book and use it as your own. If you take it out of several books, then it's research. And that's another funny ha-ha thing, but uh, not a serious statement. There's a guy being witty in an after-dinner kind of remark. Then in 1938, this was uh, attributed to somebody who was a member of something called the Algonquin Roundtable. Back in the 20s and 30s, a lot of the great literary wits of that day, like Dorothy Parker, would hang out at this one hotel and have lunch 
and essentially um, cut witty sayings on one another and especially on people who didn't come to lunch that day. And that quote there that was attributed in this book says, when you take stuff from one writer, it's plagiarism, but when you take from many writers, it's called research. And again, that's somebody trying to be clever in the manner of uh, Oscar Wilde or those sorts of uh, witty authors. I rewrote it in this way. If you steal from any author, it's plagiarism. If you attribute from many, it's research. And in fact, this saying right here, which is a stained glass window back at Florida State University, this is a over the entrance to the old library. It says, the half of knowledge is to know where to find knowledge. And what's funny is, even FSU doesn't know where that came from. They have it down as anonymous in the campus guide, but I found references to it by Sir Francis Bacon, by Dr. Samuel Johnson, and even the Latin entrance exam at King Williams College. So as best we can, we try and give proper credit to where the things came from that we want to use. So when I make a slide and I put a quote in it, I want to have looked it up and know where it came from. This is why we uh, will beat on you so much about having proper documentation for the sources that you use in your thesis paper, just like we want to see the hot links that take us to the original documents and things uh, that you reference in your journalistic reporting. In both cases, we want to tell where it came from if it was not our own original idea. And then if we are influenced by some of these ideas, then we're at least being honest that I read this, it made me think of something further, so then my idea of it goes on to this next paragraph. So we never want to be passing off cleverness from somebody else as being our own cleverness. I used to keep a folder back when I was a dean of famous people that had gotten in trouble for plagiarism. And I can't tell you how many government officials, political candidates, media commentators, uh, scholars, college presidents have gotten in trouble for lifting material and passing it off as their own. Um, when Katie Couric was at CBS, she got in trouble for uh, putting out a story that was supposed to be her personal impressions, but it was lifted from somebody else. I've seen college presidents get fired for having things in their dissertations that were part of somebody else's research. So it is, it is a risky business, and it is always safer to give credit as best we can to where we got an idea from. And this goes to ethics, that when we are doing any sort of academic or journalistic work, we're in this realm of research and creativity. Let me tell you, this is a standard of the National Science Foundation. If you want to get federal grants to do research on, on drugs and animals and physics and astronomy, you have to adhere to these standards. The same is true if uh, you're a doctor who is doing clinical trials, trying to tr test some new treatment or drug. You have to be up to these research ethical standards. So as reporters, we have an ethical standard of the profession of journalism. But as graduate students at a big university, you also have an ethical standard as an academic researcher. So I want to talk to you about how all of this comes together. There are three general areas that involve this idea of responsible conduct of research. The plan, which started all the way back in month seven, when uh, we had multimedia reporting and you started floating your idea for what you wanted to do your capstone project about. Part of what I wanted to get across to you in my feedback at that point was, is this project too big or too broad or too hard to define in order to be something that you can deliver? And then we refine that plan to give you an angle that you can actually get a write-up out of the project that you want to do. Then there's the actual conducting the research. Can you go get the interviews and the pictures and the background documents and the audio clips and the graphics and maps or whatever that you need in order to express your story? 
which now brings us to what you did last month and this month. In publishing your big capstone long form reporting piece, and now reviewing what your process was, what your results came to, and presenting that to your peers. In this case, you're doing it here within the university. But many academic researchers, what we do is we go give talks at conferences and write articles for academic journals so that other people who study the same subject can poke at what we did. That whole peer review process of putting your stuff out in front of other people who are experts in that same field is how we validate whether we did a good job ourselves. So we plan what we're going to do, we do it, and then we write it up and share it so that people can criticize our work. Kind of like you having that comment box at the bottom of your different stories. Why is there such an emphasis on this? Public support of research is much more than it ever used to be. Uh, a lot of this came out of the World War II experience where the government started investing a lot of money in universities and their research programs. So back when we were farmers, research really didn't matter much to us. But then in the post-war years and in modern times, science and technology and social studies research and medical research, uh, all of these things now have a whole lot more to do with our daily lives. Uh, think some years ago when there was a great furor about whether or not cell phones caused brain cancer, that you could get a tumor from having the phone up next to your head and that the radio waves could hurt your brain. Imagine that, that smartphone technology could make us dumber. But that had to be studied. And the government, which has a big interest in telecommunications, funded an awful lot of that health and technology research. But even if we are at a private university, as we are at Full Sail, the public has a right to expect from us that we are going to do our work ethically and honestly. So whether you work for the public directly working for a government agency or a public university, or you are working indirectly for the public by publishing your stories and presenting your information, you are beholden to the general society that you did honest, accurate work. So just as much as if you were testing experimental drugs on animals, or you are writing up your viewpoint on some social topic and publishing it on your website, the public has to trust that both kinds of researchers, the journalistic and the scientific, do honest, accurate, fair, and open work. So in a sense, we are being good citizens if we are being honest and ethical researchers. But it's not an organized profession. Nobody gives you a test like taking a bar exam or your medical boards, and then pronounces you fit to do research. And in fact, researchers, depending upon what they work on, work better in different settings. Imagine you couldn't be a wildlife researcher without going out into the jungles where the animals are. You couldn't be an oceanographic researcher if you couldn't scuba dive because you got to get down there and swim with the fish and see what they do. You couldn't be a researcher about archaeology unless you go out into the ruins and look at the ancient Egyptian and Roman buildings. So I can't give you a standard test and say, this is how you do research, because it will vary according to what you're working on. So unless you're as brilliant as Leonardo da Vinci, who could, who could write, who could draw, who could paint, who could design machines, very few of us are geniuses across so many different subjects. Instead, we get into the way research is done within our narrow field. So as a journalistic researcher, you have certain standards that you follow. And our AP style book gives us information about how to write them up and to present that information. And then when you're doing your thesis paper, you're being an academic researcher. And the only way that you learn that is by working under a research professor who teaches you the methods and coaches you on how to do your presentation. I will tell you a story on myself that's not very flattering. 
when I was at the University of Florida and working on my doctoral dissertation, my major professor asked me if I was ready to produce my paper. And I said, yes, sir, I am. I've been studying and researching and preparing this material for years. And he says, no, you're not because you've never done one before. Well, that that knocked me in a corner. But what he was trying to get me to understand is until you have done it, you don't know if you can do it successfully. After you do one, then doing research writing in the future will be much easier because now you have the confidence and experience and training and certification that you know how. So after you come out of Full Sail University, you'll be holding a master's degree. You may be uh, interested in writing for journalism magazines about the practice of journalism. And you now will have the training in order to do proper research and to comment on how this process works. But until you go through this process with me, and until you graduate and earn your degree, you will not know for sure that you can do it. So relax, let me steer and help you get your material put together and polished up in in true university fashion. Then when you come out successfully, you can go off and do this on your own because you will have had that experience. Does it apply to everybody? Only if you're on Earth. There is no portion of the professional arts and sciences. There is no country. There is no field of endeavor in which it's not important to do honest, ethical, proper reporting of whatever we have researched. So it doesn't matter if the write-up is about the earthquakes over in Nepal or if it is about the uh, presidential uh, campaign of 2016. Whatever it is that you're covering, whatever it is that you're writing up, you owe it to whoever might be reading your stuff to do a good job. And if you remember back to month seven, one of the points I made was that as soon as you hit submit, as soon as you hit publish or send, your stuff can literally go all around the world in an instant. At the speed of light, your stuff could travel to the furthest reaches of the planet. So everybody who is doing any of this kind of work is obligated to behave correctly. In a sense, we have created these ethical systems, sadly, like we have to have traffic laws because some people will speed, some people will not stop at red lights and those kinds of things. So we have to have signs and signals and lines on the road. So we have to develop these standards for people to behave correctly and sometimes we have to enforce them. But if we adhere to the values of doing good research, we'll be honest, we'll be accurate, we'll be efficient, and we'll be objective. So we won't put in misleading information. We won't fudge our figures. We won't go the long way around to explain things. And we will present a fair accounting of our information. So if there's there are things that detract from what we're trying to point out or if there are alternative viewpoints, we may well include them. At this point, I'm going to switch over and talk about some of the common language we use to describe research methods. Because after you get done forming your problem, then you're going to have to describe what methods you used in order to collect your information. How did you go get what you got to write it up? And this little book here, How to Lie with Statistics, if you see that in its 30th printing, it was still only going for $2.45, the first dean I worked for presented me a copy of this in 1984, and he was giving me his 1950 edition of the book. This is a standard little book. When people say there's lies, damned lies, and statistics, they're not kidding. So as a reporter, you probably ought to have one of these in your bag because it teaches you how to look at the statistical arguments that are presented to you by everything from government agencies to sports information directors telling you um, to draw a certain conclusion from some set of figures. And a lot of times 
they are shading the truth a little bit. But in the next several slides, I'm going to talk to you about five major things. Quantitative analysis, qualitative analysis, mixed methods, narrative analysis, and arts-based research. Now, there are many subtleties in between all of these different things, but I'm going to call these the five major methodology schools. So let me take each one of them in turn. Quantitative analysis is the numbers-based information, and it relies on good data collection. And this uh, exhibit here, this uh, question number seven, where I have the graph presented, that's actual work that I did and presented for Cornell University out of my own doctoral dissertation. The way that you graph your information can sometimes show you trends that you can't see from the numbers themselves. So that uh, diagonal line shows that there is a positive relationship between how much money a college has in the bank and how many people they devote to going out to raise the money. So without showing you the equations, without showing you the statistics underneath it, you can look at that line and see, yep, that's a generally upward trend. That's a positive relationship. So just from looking at the picture, I can see the relationship between all of those different dots. And I tell you, the data crunching can be done by basic programs like Excel, even in PowerPoint or Keynote. If you put it, your data into a little table and have it make a graph out of it, it will show you some of these relationships. But it all has to do with whether or not you collected complete numerical information. So if you get um, a set of statistics, it could be uh, batting averages for the same guy over the same uh, uh, over some period of time, like right off the back of his baseball card. That's data collection. And it's in rows and columns because it's by years and by amounts. So entering that information, you don't have to use a powerful stats program like SPSS. You can do this with pencil and paper. But if it is numerically based research, it's quantitative. So look at the N in quantitative and let that rem remind you of the word numbers. Then the next thing is qualitative analysis. And let the L in qualitative remind you that it's about language. So this is going to be verbally based analysis. Your ability to have a good use of language, communication, and observation skills. This is the stuff that you get from your interviews. This can be stuff that you get from looking at other documents. And I give you an odd word in here, domaining. And notice how this highlights for you. When we're domaining, we're trying to clump words together. Let me tell you how I did this project. I was doing a study about services for college students with disabilities, and I pulled abstracts of dissertations over a five-year period. University of Michigan has a directory of all of this stuff. And I was looking for key words in the abstracts of these research papers. So reading skill did not necessarily appear in those exact same words. Maybe it was called literacy one time. Maybe one time it was called reading level or reading comprehension. So I'm writing down all of these different words that I'm seeing appearing in these documents, and then I group them around this idea of reading or around learning disabilities or we're up there where it says community colleges. Maybe at some places it said two-year colleges. And those are common terms for the same thing. So you do some pencil and paper work and you try and group your terms. And that's called domaining, where you're trying to put them in a common domain where your words are of similar type to each other. So up there where it said career vocational education, some places it might have said technical education or vocational technical. But I'm looking for the repetition of these common phrases. And then I see how frequently they appear. So I'm looking at the language, kinds of phrases being used, kinds of words that appear more than once, 
and I'm trying to figure out how frequently these phrases are used, that might give me some idea of how often these things are being studied. So if if people that you interview keep talking about unemployment in one way or another, saying it in multiple ways, that term unemployment now is giving you a qualitative hook that this is a major thing people were interested in. When I did my man on the street interviews, a lot of people said something about unemployment, finding a job, job market. They had these different kinds of phrases that I could group under the domain of unemployment. And then you can start making some sense out of how uh, how intense people feel or are interested in these subjects. Mixed methods is more likely what you did in your projects. And it is increasingly popular because it relates to the way that you use multimedia for different kinds of readers and diverse learning styles amongst the people that might run across your information. In your stories, did you have things that you expressed by text where you wrote it out? Did you show some things by pictures and pictorial essays? Did you have video clips, music or audio clips? Did you have graphs and maps? So you covered the same things, but in different ways because you use different kinds of storytelling. What we find is in this project here that I did when I gave a speech out in Texas about uh, aviation disasters, we had some language that managers would use to describe what sort of threat their area might be under. And then they did some numerical work, rating them as low, medium, or high to put some number values on them. So it was a combination of words and figures for them to figure out what emergencies uh, their airports might experience, what things they might want to prepare against. More and more, we see people are not doing just quantitative research or just qualitative research. They use both. So like in the previous slide, as those words repeated, that led to me quantifying it by counting up how frequently they were. Or I collect data like I did about the college fundraising, and then I want to go interview experts and talk to college presidents and college fundraisers to get some quotes from them where they tell me stories or give me their opinions to help give context to the flat figures that I had received. No one type is better or worse than the other. I think sometimes they work better in partnership where you get some words to help explain your figures or you get some figures to back up the quotes that you received. I think previously in one of our classes, I talked about how sometimes I will take pictures to sell a story or I will write a story to sell a batch of pictures. And again, it's that same kind of partnership, I think, that happens between words and numbers just as much as they do between words and pictures. Narrative analysis is a whole nother thing. Sometimes we call this close reading, and it draws a little bit from literary criticism. Remember when we talked about narrative storytelling technique, and you use some techniques that fiction writers use in order to do narrative? Well, this is a 20th century kind of a modern technique, and it looks at how we use words and phrases. I was doing a research project for my master's about how the news media cover terrorism incidents. And one of the biggest problems I ran into was, what the hell is terrorism? What do we mean by that word? And I started looking at the literature, you know, FBI uh, rules and regulations, public laws that were passed, uh, what academic researchers had written, and I found that there were dozens of so-called official definitions of what terrorism was. But in looking at all of those pieces of literature, I found three particular phrases. The terrorism is always violence or the threat of violence. So like a bomb threat would just be as much terrorism as a bomb itself. It's directed against non-combatants. If you bomb an army base or you bomb a ship, you're fighting against a military enemy. But if you bomb the Boston Marathon, those people out there running a road race, they're not in combat. They're in athletics. 
So if you bomb a school or a movie theater or a, a road race, you're, you're bombing regular people. You're not actually fighting a war. You're taking on civilians. And then lastly, are you doing this for political or publicity purposes? Are you trying to get your social or your religious agenda over? If you're just if you're bombing something because that's a bridge that you don't want the enemy to use to bring their troops over, you're bombing that for a military reason. But if you're bombing an expressway just hoping that lots of people will get killed when the bridge falls in, so then they'll pay attention to uh, whatever your um, ideological argument is, then you're doing it for political or publicity purposes. So I was able to come up with these clumps of common language, a one, two, three part test. And now actually the Department of Homeland Security, the official United States government definition is very much like this because amazingly, they did the similar kind of research looking at all these different definitions in all of the literature. And by closely looking at the words and phrases being used, they could find these common trends and build a definition out of them just as I had done independently. So close reading would mean that you looked in great detail. Uh, one of the examples I found today, it said you could take uh, a three-minute song, you could examine those lyrics, and you could write a whole book that examines every word in that song or in a poem and expanding on why that word means this and how connected to the next word it means something else. People can write, uh, uh, they can write books about Shakespeare's plays that are longer than the plays themselves because they're looking at what every word means. Uh, Bible scholars, religious researchers do the very same thing. Uh, think about how many books there are in a library written about the Bible and how, how small the Bible itself is, and you get some sense of what narrative analysis is all about. You can take every verse, every chapter, and expand it. You could take one psalm, and you could write an entire article just about something that, that barely takes up an inch on a piece of paper. So narrative analysis is when you went and looked at other reports. You looked at source documents, and you were finding the important phrases that stuck out to you, the language that you saw being reused, and that indicated to you some trend that maybe you ought to research. The last thing that I want to talk about is a relatively new deal. It's really after uh, the year 2000 when this new thing called arts-based research was recognized as a technique. But if we go back and look at even a great genius like Picasso, he said, I never made a painting to be art. It's all research. How did he understand the human body? How did he understand emotions? Uh, why did he paint uh, the guitarist in sad shades of blue and have the man in a sad uh, body posture? He was interrogating the subject. And by that, I mean he was questioning it, just like a, a detective would interrogate a criminal suspect. We interrogate a subject through the use of art by using our artistic technique to ask questions about what does it mean? How does it work? Uh, you could choreograph a dance to show how people move. Oral histories, when you talk to people and have them tell you their stories. You're writing down a narrative and using that to illustrate what it was like when people lived through the Great Depression or World War II or the Soviet Union or whatever period of history you're trying to describe or a part of the country. And a lot of the work that some of you have done at this university when we do documentary film and photography, you are using an artistic tool, be it a still camera or a video camera, in order to tell a story, to document what was going on at a certain place at a certain time. The famous photojournalist Margaret Bork White, who did um, government-funded research about the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl of the 30s and worked for Life magazine, and she did work about the concentration camps uh, of World War II. She went to India 
and documented the Indian independence movement where India and Pakistan broke away from the British Empire. That is a classic example of using an artistic tool in order to do research and tell about the human condition in these situations. And what I found really interesting today for an upcoming conference that unfortunately I can't attend, but the American Psychological Association is now having a film festival. And here you see the standards for the entries in the film contest to illustrate psychological phenomena through different types of feature films, short films, avant-garde presentations. I mean, even the Oscar award-winning movie uh, Ordinary People that had um, Mary Tyler Moore and Robert Redford in it was about teen suicide. So it was a fictional story, but it could illustrate that psychological issue through the storytelling of making a movie. So when we think about Things that we have trained you to do in this program, how to make graphics, how to make animations, how to uh, make narrated slideshows, how to make audio clips and how to edit those together, how to make documentary videos that you have posted on your websites. Those are ways in which you have used artistic techniques in order to present what you have learned through your research about some social issue that you were doing reporting. So I think this arts-based research, or going back to the earlier slides where we talked about responsible conduct of research and creativity, this is how research and creativity come together in a modern technique, very much in line with what you did in your long-form reporting in order to illustrate, demonstrate, to show, not tell, what happened with the subjects that you were researching. And I think this is a very powerful and modern thing, and I'm glad to be at a university where, where we get to do that and teach that. So let me fire the microphones up and give you all an opportunity to talk back to me. If I can get my cursor to wake up, here we go. And I am unmuting everybody. All right. Observations, comments about uh, what you've seen tonight. I have a, a couple questions. One about what about tonight, and then one about something moving forward. If that's okay. Far away. Okay. Um, the first question is when we are beginning to write. Um, our thesis as far as um, explaining our methods is it do we need to specify exactly which one we use whether it was quantitative or qualitative or can we say it without expressly saying it at this point I would go ahead and state it explicitly and if you have aspects where you had some quantitative elements and you had some qualitative elements then say so, and, and you could even use the phrase mixed methods, which is probably more likely for most of you. But when we are publishing the results of our research, part of what we're trying to do is to show future researchers who might look at our paper how we did it. So when we can state to, for them, I obtained quantitative information from these government records or from these official company reports or from the Wall Street Journal or wherever my numbers came from, and you have an example of quantitative collection, then go ahead and say so and use that. If you did some interviews and you did field observations, you attended things and uh, wrote up summaries of them, then you did qualitative work. So it, like if if somebody went to go live in France and then wrote up their experience of, li of living in France, that would be qualitative because that was observation. If instead they collected information from the French Tourist Bureau and the U.S. Department of State about numbers of travelers back and forth, that's quantitative information. So I would go ahead and get used to using those terms just to describe the kinds of things you collected. Okay, perfect. Um, my second question is regarding the project as a whole. Uh -huh. I, I see that we're going to submit the 
final thesis paper um, on the, I think in week four, on the 20, uh, I think it, the due date was like the 28th. I was just curious to know for some of us that received the information that there would be a graduation ceremony for us on the 26th, will we have an opportunity to turn the, the final paper in a little early or is that the final deadline? Well, here, here's how that will work, and I just had to deal with that today, that um, we can anticipate based on the first three weeks because you're actually going to assemble your paper in pieces, and then in week four, essentially, you just paste them together and make whatever changes to it that I have suggested to you. So really, ah. by the time I see what you did week one, week two, week three, I know what you're turning in in week four. Got you. Because I already read your drafts of it and have already given you comments about go back and fix this or move these sentences around or what have you. So when I give you feedback on week one, make those fixes and save it and so on on week two and week three. And then when you come to week four, all you're really doing is stringing it together and making sure it's all proofread and cleaned up. Got you. OK, so, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that that way, there's no surprise in week four. And since you've been building it all along, it's not like you got a 10 page paper to write in week four. Instead, you wrote three pages and three pages and three pages and you put them together. That's why we have it broken up into these chapters and sections so that each week, you know, you knocked out so much percentage of your work. Got it. Thank you so much. Well, see, we don't we don't want this to be that you get to week four and you're trying to mash out the whole big thing Sunday night. It's a lot easier if you write it up, clean it up, save it, write it up, clean it up, save it. And then at the end, put them all together. which is the same way you would do it at any other university. Um, it's just a difference of scale. But uh, yeah, my chapter two, my literature review, that was one whole course for me. But we did that separately and it was all cleaned up. And then I saved it to like three different discs because I wanted to make sure I had a clean copy that I you know, could always find one. And then I put that away. That's done. Then I worked on my methodology chapter. And then once that was all cleaned up, saved it, put it away, it was done. Then when it came time to put the final thing together, I knew I had some parts that were already finished. So this way, we'll just walk through it a little bit at a time each week. Then there's no freak out uh, at the end of the end of the program. Good questions. Anything else? All right. Hearing none, everybody seeming to be all caught up. Then um, I'm going to go ahead and sign us out, get this recording saved, and uh, share it with all those people who will be jealous tomorrow that they didn't get to sit through this with us tonight. So uh, good seeing you all again and looking forward to working with you and getting you graduated. Good night, everybody.